I know you're having a wonderful time getting to kind of chat and catch up with uh, your friends and colleagues outside of this morning's session. So it's wonderful to go ahead and begin our 2017 Conference of Champions. I'm Nicole Kreitz from 3TV, Arizona's family here in Phoenix. So I anchor the Good Evening Arizona. And I am just honored to be your MC at this year's amazing conference. I've had the opportunity to be working with our local Arthritis Foundation friends uh, for several years now, always helping with the annual Arthritis Walk at the Phoenix Zoo. And I bring my kids every year because I always think, what a great opportunity. It's at the Phoenix Zoo, and then the families get a chance to um, have a chance. Sorry, I'm having a little mixed minus here. The families have an opportunity to stay and play and hang out at the zoo, and it is just a great time. But in those years, I've also had the opportunity to profile some of the people who are fighting this fight every day. And for me personally, I know everyone in this room is either working for the cause, dealing with finding a cure, a patient themselves, an advocate, and so we thank you for being here today to be a part of finding a cure, finding more symptom-free days. But in my sphere of influence, I didn't have anyone in my close circle of friends or families who had dealt with arthritis before. And so we have done some stories over the years about overcoming misperceptions and things that people think of. When they think of arthritis, we had done a story one year about a lot of people think it's, it's something you get when you get older, okay? So we focused on a juvenile arthritis patient and had the opportunity to talk about how big of an impact that is on kids growing up just trying to do things, play games and sports and be a kid and have an opportunity to go out and um, not have a body with aches and pains. And then we've also talked about just the way that it changes your life, your everyday life. And um, even for me, it's kind of a paradigm shift as I'm pushing 40 next year. I think about like the things that we try to do to fight mother nature, fight father time. I got kind of wrangled into running a Ragnar relay. Have any of you guys ever heard about these insane relays? My husband's in law enforcement, so he goes, I'm getting together a law enforcement team for the Ragnar. And we ended up pulling it off. I was the only female and only civilian on the team, but in 20 hours, we completed 124 miles cumulatively, I know. So I started feeling, ooh, the aches in my joints, my knees, my ankles, things like that. And it's uh, just a reminder of the things that we so often take for granted. Many of the people who this isn't part of their everyday aches and pains and life. And so I also thought about, um, on my way over here, about how all I do as I'm fighting, you know, like I said, aging, you're trying to do the best that you can to be healthy and every day, but if that wasn't something that was just easy to do, go to the gym, um, work on that diet, things like that, uh, it is really interesting to kind of have that paradigm shift and see what it's like to deal with this as your everyday normal. So it's so awesome, and I've said before to some of the folks visiting from nationals, how cool it is. I work with a lot of local nonprofits. And the walk every year, I recognize some of our friends here from the walk every year who come. The doctors, the local doctors, really turn out for this event. And it is so cool for patients to see their physicians outside the clinic, outside the doctor's office. And they just have the biggest hearts. So it's really cool to have them fighting to be champions for this cause. Throughout the conference, please use your conference app. Everything is made so much easier through social media and technology. It's got everything you need, the palm of your hand, and the pocket agenda is available as a reference for what's next and what's happening now. Before dividing into our opening sessions, let's celebrate this year's generous sponsors, pre presenting sponsor, Lily, as well as AbbVie, Janssen, Novartis, and Pfizer. A big thank you so much. Thank you for making this conference possible and supporting the volunteers who go above and beyond for the arthritis community. This year's conference will encourage us to dig deep and think about our purpose, our passion, and consider how we can welcome and grow our community of volunteers. 
And remember to share your purpose and passion with your friends and family on social media. I already sent out a tweet, so you can just search the hashtag Purpose Passion 17, and I tagged the Arthritis Foundation. It's uh, kind of truncated there, so you can just search for hashtag Purpose Passion 17. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the kids are doing it these days, but it just allows people who aren't in this room to see what's important to you, and maybe that starts and sparks a conversation, influence, um, and also uh, potential volunteers and donors who may not have heard about the cause that's close to your heart. Over the next two days, we're going to hear from tireless volunteers, dynamic speakers, and special guests, including Mark Boutin, our president and CEO for the National Health Council, who will be joining us very shortly. We'll also be joined by celebrities, including Anna Villafanye and Matt Eisman, who will share their personal stories, their talent, their purpose, and their passion with us as well. Let's leave this conference feeling even more energized and being able to connect with why we volunteer, why we wake up every day committed to helping people with arthritis live a fuller life while pursuing a cure. I want to personally welcome everyone to Phoenix. I've lived here in Phoenix for the last 13 years. I'm from Arizona, grew up down in Tucson, went away for a little bit um, to the inland northwest in the uh, Spokane, Washington area and dealt with what a real winter felt like and I thought let's come back and start a family here in Arizona. But from our beautiful outdoors to of course locals who call themselves Phoenicians, I hope you will see why I'm proud to call Phoenix home. Phoenix, our state of Arizona, is also home to many of our dedicated and impassioned foundation volunteers. One very special volunteer is Jill Lopez, and Jill joined the Arthritis Foundation Arizona Leadership Board in February of 2014 and became board chair in 2016. Among many other foundation activities, she sits on the Arizona Walk to Cure Arthritis Revenue Committee and has also served on the Oscar Gala Planning Committee. This year, Jill's team raised $4,000 for the walk, and her husband, Eddie Lopez, raised more than $1,500 for the pilot Give Green, Get Green campaign. And I'd like you to please join me in welcoming Jill Lopez to the stage for a very warm and local welcome. Welcome all of you here to Arizona. So first off, good afternoon. Thank you for attending. Welcome to the most populous uh, state capital in the US with more than 1.5 million people in Arizona, many of which have Arizona. So thank you. Welcome by a show of hands. How many have come more than two hours away? That is most of us in this room, and thank you so much for attending. Welcome to Arizona. I, I, I want to share with you my own personal story, which I, I first will lead with, I don't have arthritis. Um, however, it's what got me into this organization, and I think it's a kind of sage to what's happening and how we get others involved. But for myself, 26 years ago, I was diagnosed with a really rare disease called mastocytosis. Um, upon joining the board, I actually found the only other person I've ever met in my life with it, and she was on the Arizona board. But needless to say, I live my life um, probably every three to four hours with what we affectionately call heads or tails. I get sick. Um, I, my best friend is a little air sick bag. We, we buy them by the thousands and um, I carry them in my purse and every car um, and that has been a challenge in our life to manage how frequently I get sick. So you may see me running from a room or something and I, and I didn't mean to ignore you. I actually have a mission <laughs> I'm headed to. but. Um, with that said, it, it progressed into a much worse situation when my entire body hurt. I ended up with um, Crohn's, colitis, eosinophilic gastroenteritis, 
lupus, fibromyalgia. Um, I was diagnosed with RA and lupus, lupus, and two years later, this was uh, four years ago, um, it, it turned out to be a false, um, false positive. But for two years, I was living with what I thought was RA and lupus. Um, my joints had swollen. I couldn't wear my wedding rings. I couldn't wear any rings. And um, fortunately for me, it turned into something else, not RA. However, in that time, I experienced what my guess is many of you and those who we are fighting for experience. And I will say it is life changing. There was many a time where, well, I'll say there was many years from birth of my children up until probably they were at least age seven. Um, I couldn't be alone with my kids. Um, I would go get sick and it could be anywhere from 20 minutes to three hours. Um, up until last year, this is exciting for me because I love to shop or I like new things. <laughs> but um, it was the first year, two years ago, I could actually go to the mall. So I got to take my kids to the mall. Um, I've never alone taken them to the zoo or any of these type situations because we never know what's gonna happen um, with my health. So I completely relate and understand the pain and lifestyle of living with pain. At which time, when I was diagnosed with RA, I was also approached by the Arthritis Foundation and the timing was perfect, but at the same time, I realized there was a whole opportunity of people, or I'll say my opportunity of people that I can go in and help. And for me, my personal situation is pain drives me other people's pain, specifically not so much my pain, I try to just tamp it down, but when I realize other people are existing and living with extreme or acute pain, and there's something we can do to make a change about it, that's my purpose. So my passion is to change the lives of so many, but my purpose is to go in and make legislative change make changes daily in people's lives that will give them a better opportunity and a better outcome. Which is also why many of us are in this room today. After um, I was, uh, we found out that it actually wasn't arthritis, it was somewhat of a relief, but we're still trying to figure out where we go from there. Um, in that time, my husband was diagnosed with RA. My husband is a former army ranger, a sniper, um, and with that, the only reason I bring up sniper is because he had many, many hours of shooting an unlimited number of bullets, which you don't typically get in the military unless you're sniper school, SODAC, or, um, or a ranger. Um, needless to say, his hands are challenging. His ankles, uh, he gets up in the middle of the night to use the restroom and you can see it's a, it's, it's a good few minute walk to the restroom just to get his ankles warmed up. But if you're unaware of this today, it is the number two reason for military discharge, arthritis. Dwarfed only recently by PTSD. So number two, arthritis. We have a huge opportunity in this, in this organization and this country. So I encourage you, each one of you, to incredibly lean in to this event and really get yourself almost to the point of uncomfortable. Something that scares you, something that you're reaching a little further for. This is the time to do it. This is the organization and the group to not be embarrassed uh, in front of, to ask those questions, to do those role plays. If you had any fear prior, let's get rid of it here. Let's focus on how do we take it to that next level, living with our purpose in mind. And I call it the why. Why are you here? What got you involved? What makes you want to make a difference? And what can we do next? So 
the goal from X to Y by when. And that's always how I kind of look at things. What is our goal today? Where do we need to go? And what's the date? So if you break it down into pieces, if you're a leadership board chair, that ideally is the best way to present it to people in bite-sized pieces. I've said a lot. Um, I could probably go on for hours, but I'm sure there's a stage cane with my name on it somewhere. So again, my, my, my point to you is lean in and take as much as you can out of this. And when you leave, fear not about asking for, for whether it's in-kind donations, whether it is a donation, whether it's time. There are more than enough people in this country looking for our help and needing what we're doing here. So again, I thank you for coming and I really look forward to what we come out on the other end with this, um, with this conference. So again, thank you and shortly, Ann Palmer, our CEO and president, will be sharing her successes from this past year and inspire us to look forward into 2018, encouraging us to lead with our purpose and drive our passion. And following Anne, we'll be hearing from Mark Budin. He is the CEO of the National Health Council, and he will share his perspective on healthcare and the importance of bringing patients and healthcare providers together for a better outcome. Thank you again, and welcome to Arizona. The weather worked out, and we're so happy to have you. Enjoy. It is my pleasure to introduce you now to our president and CEO, Ann M. Palmer. Everyone, so great to have you here. We've been so excited to greet you, and it's nice to finally be here in this beautiful, uh, this beautiful setting. You know, I hope that we're going to have a lot of time to celebrate together, uh, to network, and to leave charged up and ready to go back and do even better things next year. You know, it's like a family reunion of sorts, and uh, it's great for me, and I hope it is for you. And I just want to call out a few specific people and, and welcome them or groups. Certainly our local leadership board chairs who are here. We have many of them in the room and we thank you for being here. We have a whole bunch of our ASN leaders and I want to welcome you as well. And our patient, yeah, we can applaud. Uh, our Patient Leadership Council members, they'll be meeting on uh, Saturday and many of them are here with us. Um, our AOPI and other partners and supporters, so uh, our Harding Award winners, we have a great group here, so again, so glad to have you all here. A lot of what we hear about is that um, networking is uh, a great, great part of this and we want to make that easier, and I would show you that if I had the clicker to advance my slides. Great, thank you. So uh, to make it easier, you'll see that we have some ribbons and bands and ways for you to connect with folks. So you know, um, we've accomplished a lot this last year and I'm gonna indulge myself in, in uh, celebrating some of those accomplishments and uh, then we'll turn to the future. So we're very proud of our work in advocacy and access. And uh, this year was an important year, a tough year. We had lots of times where we had to take our voice, the, the patient voice and perspective to the hill. And I feel very proud that we really inserted ourselves in that conversation and really reminded people of the special needs of people with arthritis and people with chronic diseases. You know, we created a great access toolkit, uh, which has templates and tools and ways to help people as they face the administrative challenges of access to care. We participated in real time with volunteers and staff in over 160 bills last year in 39 states. And while that's an impressive statistic, the thing to understand is that we impacted millions and millions of lives. We made a difference for real people, individual people, people who are struggling with step therapy, 
who have six children, sick children, and we made a difference in Indiana and Texas and other states with this legislation. You know, in JA, we, we've had a good year. We uh, set an aggressive goal, and uh, so far this year, we've introduced almost 3,000 new families to the Arthritis Foundation. With a backpack filled with resources, we've offered them opportunities at JA Days across the country, over 50 camps, and two great conferences where we really offered a life-changing interaction. We've deepened our relationship with CARA and are really talking with them about aggressively transforming the way we deliver care to families. With our funding, CARA was able to expand their, their registry and add lupus, JDM, and sclerodoma. So we feel very proud of the work that we're doing in this arena. You know, in the help and support area, we often look at these tools or think about the work that we do with the helpline or people accessing our tools, and it, it doesn't feel personal to us. But 700 people called the helpline and as I was able to listen and read some of the transcripts, these are people who really needed help, had serious problems, couldn't find a doctor in California that would take Medicare, and we were able to help them. People that were struggling with the fact that they were overcome with fatigue and felt embarrassed to talk with their friends and families about that, and we connected them with support groups in our, in our communities. People that we helped find an orthopedic surgeon who would take their payment plan so that they could go ahead and see that doctor. So when we think about these things, we're, we're truly creating impact. We also have our AT Magazine and special publications, which are our calling card in doctor's offices. And collectively, we raise millions of dollars to fund our program and to invest that back into conquering arthritis. This year, we launched a major gift campaign, something that the Foundation hasn't done in many, many years. And we've had a successful start to that. You'll hear more about it later, later in the conference. We ran over 250 events, some of them very, very successful. Events like the gala in Chicago, the Taste of the Town in Santa Barbara, the Danbury Golf, where volunteers worked hard and filled a room and told our story. As I said, we use this money to invest in our programs every day and into an important scientific agenda. And I'm going to talk just briefly about the work that we're doing in osteoarthritis because, I, one, I'm very proud of it, and number two, we have a huge opportunity as an organization to really take the boulder out of the road to discovery, to enable for People want to, for people to want to invest in creating real cures for OA. And as part of that, we hosted what's called a patient-focused drug development uh, meeting in DC. And the goal there was to bring the patient perspective to the FDA in hopes that they will change their regulatory stance on clinical trials. And on the screen here, you'll see a quote where Janet Woodcock basically acknowledged the wonderful job that we did and is holding the way we did patient-focused drug development up as an example and a way to move forward for other organizations. You know, we've made some good choices this year. And if we make good choices going forward, uh, we'll do even better things. And when I think about choices, it reminds me of this quote. When we make a choice, we change the future. And I want to thank each of you in this room. You didn't have a choice about having arthritis or having a loved one with arthritis, but you had a choice about coming to the Arthritis Foundation, about taking action, doing something important to help yourself. And then many of you in this room have gone on not to just help yourself, but to help others. And I thank you for that. You know, just as Jill was talking about, and as many of you in this room know, facing a di diagnosis of arthritis is a horrible thing. It suddenly and abrupt abruptly changes your life. It calls into question everything you've hoped to do. 
You have to think every day about how you're going to manage this disease. And this is made worse because it's often invisible or misunderstood. It affects the entire family. And it often leads people feeling isolated, angry, or worse, hopeless. Our mandate as an organization is to ensure that when people are diagnosed with arthritis, that they come out on the other side. They come out with a plan, a way of dealing with the everyday struggles, and that they're hopeful. It is our job to assist at the point of diagnosis, to show people that they're not alone, to help them make connections with others like themselves and with the resources of the foundation, showing them that not only can they live a good life, but they can help the entire community, that their insights will be able to benefit not just themselves, but other. And hopefulness comes from this. <clears throat> Hopefulness comes from recognizing that a diagnosis isn't the end of the world necessarily, that you're going to be able to live a good life, and more importantly, that you're going to be able to help others. You know, we're doing this all the time. There are many volunteers in this room who are assisting people along their journey. I had the privilege this year of attending both JA conferences, and I heard a wonderful story that Adam Vigil told about his angel. You know, he and his family have been, had been struggling with a diagnosis of systemic JIA, and they had picked up a brochure and gone to the walk where they met their angel, angel Colleen Ryan, who's here with us today. And Colleen greeted them and said, you're not alone. I'm going to be along beside you. The foundation is going to be here with you. We're going to help you with this. And personally invited the Adam Vigil family to attend the JA conference. There are others in this room like this. Liz and Steve Smith, who for 20 years have greeted others, who literally stand at the door of the JA conference and greet others and welcome them to our family and help them meet new people. Liz was willing to take an email or talk on the phone anytime to another JA mom. But if you think about your li most life-changing moments with the foundation, try to imagine the most important interaction you've had so far. They were probably face-to-face. -face. They were a time where someone greeted you and said, how are you doing? Or gave you some advice about how to do better in life. Maybe just a hug over a cup of coffee to encourage you to do better in life. But all too often, people who are newly diagnosed are left to their own devices. They don't have a Colleen. They don't have an Adam. They don't have a Liz and Steve Smith to help them along the way. They're left to their own devices to try to find resources. And as they do, they can feel isolated and alone, maybe in despair. And we simply cannot let that happen. We have to help people at the point of diagnosis know that we're there to help them. So what if we took what we're doing now, what we're doing well now, the JA experience, where we're personally greeting people, we're connecting them with others like themselves, we're giving them expert information. But what if we did this for everyone, not just those who came to face-to-face -face meetings? <clears throat> Each year, millions of people come to the Arthritis Foundation, primarily on arthritis.org, at the point of diagnosis. They're looking for answers. They're looking to get help from us. It's a confusing time. And we need to greet those people. We need to extend a warm welcome and say, we're here to help you. We're going to come alongside. We're going to be your life partner in helping you overcome your everyday no's and make them yeses. We're going to enable you to become empowered to live a better life. And as you join our community, 
we'll be able to do great things together. We'll be able to take our collective insights and begin to make dramatic improvements in care. So how are we going to do this? We're going to do it two ways. We're going to do it online, and we're going to do it with you. So we're going to begin to have a more personal, a more intuitive, a more faster experience for people as they come to the web and as they come to our new mobile app, Live Yes. There, people will be able to exp experience a digital community, a positive experience. We'll be able to connect them with others like themselves, even though they're not at a meeting. The second will be you. Each of you in this room are already serving as tour guides or champions and have the desire to help others. So let's pause a minute and take a look at a quick video. Imagine wandering through a deep, dark forest with no clear path to follow, without a compass or a map, feeling lost and unsure which way to turn. That's what being on a journey with arthritis can feel like. Scary, overwhelming, powerless, the Arthritis Foundation is here to help bring you out of the woods. For decades, we've been the world's most trusted go-to place for everything about arthritis, providing useful information, tools, and resources that put you in control of your own situation. With a network of volunteers, patient experts, healthcare providers, and everyday people who understand what you're going through, who you can connect with and count on for hope and support. Now, we've embarked on something new, a dynamic experience that's personalized and customized with you in mind, both online and through in-person interactions. Based on your personal interests and needs, we'll take you right to your chosen destination, cutting through the clutter, avoiding detours and bumps in the road, making it all relevant to you. It's all made possible by technology and propelled by Arthritis Foundation volunteers those who are most passionate about what really matters to arthritis patients because they've been there. But ultimately, you are in the driver's seat, in charge of what's relevant to you. Share stories and ideas, get involved in local events, start your own fundraising campaigns, find volunteer opportunities, participate in arthritis research, advocate for protective policies and laws, make connections that make a difference in person and online. Rest assured, we're always there to support you, whenever and wherever you need us. Empowered to help yourself and improve your own quality of life, you'll also be able to support those around you and even the larger arthritis community. You'll get out of the forest with a connected, guided experience and continue your journey feeling confident you're headed in the right direction. Your direction. Your destination. Volunteers are essential to moving this forward. Thank you for being a tour guide. So many of you are already serving as tour guides. But in this next year, we want to really be able to unleash your passion and allow for more tour guides, to formalize it, to operationalize it, to find a way that we can ensure that as people come to the Arthritis Foundation, they're making connections. They're finding the great tools and resources that we already have. So in 2018, we'll formalize a new model of programming. We'll, we'll formalize the role of tour guide or champion. We'll need many of you in this room to volunteer to become champions. We'll need you to help us host events and local programs where we offer social connectivity and real programs where we meet the individual needs of the people who come to us. But the exciting part is that as we do this, we will not only be impacting many, many millions more people than we are now, we will also be growing more champions. And as we grow champions who are empowered to take care of themselves and who join our community and want to do better and, and are willing to share their insights about healthcare, that we begin to have more, more momentum we begin to start a movement. So let's seize this opportunity. Let's move forward with a clear plan and purpose. Let's unleash the power of volunteers. Because as we do this, our community will grow. Our family will grow. We'll have many more champions who are equipped 
to help others and equipped to talk about arthritis, to talk about it as a serious disease and one that needs to be reckoned with, we will begin to gain further momentum. We can become a movement. As we do that, as we collect more insights from our constituents, those insights become a powerful tool, a tool that can change the future of healthcare for people with arthritis. We can turn patient insights into a powerful tool that will make a difference for many millions of people and for the entire community. As our voice becomes louder, we are able to create a groundswell, a groundswell of people, of champions who are making a difference and telling our story and who are saying arthritis is a serious disease that needs to be reckoned with. Millions of people empowered in making a difference in this country in the very important disease that's affecting millions of people. This is our time. This is our time. Let's take the microphone. Let's create a movement. Let's conquer arthritis. Thank you. So now I have the great pleasure of introducing Mark Booten. Mark Booten, as you've heard, is the uh, CEO of the National Health Council, which is a very prominent organization in Washington, D.C. that represents organizations like ours and brings to other, together other organizations uh, to deal with chronic diseases. Mark is a very well-respected and renowned advocate, public policy leader in Washington, D.C. I have the privilege of serving on his board, and it's a great pleasure for us to have him here with us. Thank you very much for being here, Mark. So good afternoon, everyone. I know we got a lot more energy in this room now. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh, I love it. This is my kind of crowd. I am really excited to be here today. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what the National Health Council is doing and what's going on in Washington and how the environment is changing. But I want to take a minute and tell you my personal story. I think everybody in this room has a story. I think all of us do. I grew up in a rural part of Maine. Is there anybody in the audience from Maine? All right, we, there we go, I see you. We don't get out much. <laughs> Where I grew up, most people didn't have electricity or running water. In fact, we brought the water in from the lake that was just outside the house. When I was 13, from reading books, I knew there was a big world out there. And I saw an advertisement in our local newspaper and I wrote an essay and I won that essay contest and a few months later, I was living in Denmark. I've been on my own since I was 13. I spent about 15 years living in Europe and Asia, going to different countries, studying different languages, eventually ending up with a British law degree. I had actually settled down in Belgium. I was about to take a job with the European communities. And I'll begin to date myself. This was before we had a Europe, and certainly long before Brexit. I was so excited to start that job. And over the course of a few short months, I got the calls from my family, where virtually everyone in my family was diagnosed with one or more chronic conditions. They ranged from heart disease, cancer, autoimmune, neurologic, HIV, and rare disease. We had it all and all at once, and so I decided to change course. I moved to Boston, and I lived in Boston for 15 years. I chose Boston because I could be relatively close to my family. And I watched as they suffered with their diseases. And over a two-year period, I watched as each one of them succumbed to their disease for two reasons. One, either there were no effective treatments for their disease, and they simply withered away and died, or because the system didn't respond to their needs, and as a result, they died. I started volunteering with many of the patient organizations in the Boston area, in the name of my family. 
was all about trying to bring voice to the people who have these conditions. And I was stunned going back 25 years ago how limited and how blunted our voice was. I made that my passion and I made it my career. And I've been doing this for quite some time. I've been with the National Health Council now for 15 years. The National Health Council is an umbrella organization formed by patient advocacy organizations in the 1920s. It's all of the leading patient advocacy organizations, and you know the Arthritis Foundation is there. As Anne mentioned, she is on the board of directors, helping to lead the charge on behalf of this entire community. We heard earlier that you can feel alone. There are 133 million people in the United States with one or more chronic diseases. Most people have more than one and most of them are invisible. That represents more than a third of the population. That's a lot of people. Thankfully, the patient organizations have been around for quite some time. We provide services, we provide information, we provide advocacy. How many of you in the room knew that the patient organizations were first created more than 300 years ago? Anyone? We actually predate the country. And all those text messages and emails and infograms you're sending right now, they all went via Pony Express. <laughs> and think about that for a minute. We were created to bring people with chronic disease and their family members together to provide services, to provide care, to help support them. And 300 years ago, we were the most effective method to do that. 300 years later, the environment is changing. Technology is changing, health is changing, treatments are changing, our ability to pay for treatments is shifting, a lot in the environment. And as a result, we have to start thinking about how we do things differently. One of the things that I'm excited about is that we've started a movement to ensure that the voice of the patient is heard and acted upon. Now that's not easy. We have centuries and centuries of creating a health system that is paternalist and it looks after us. We are the subjects of that system. We are treated. We need to turn that into a system where it is co-designed with us. How many of you have a smartphone? Want to hold them up? Quite a few of you. I can tell you, actually I'm curious in the office, how many of you have an apple? How many of you have a Blackberry? Ooh. Usually the Blackberry people work for government. Not sure. And there are reasons for that. It's actually more secure. How many of you have a Samsung? Okay, you're the innovators. Love it. I can tell you not a single manufacturer of a smartphone would even change the color of that phone without first doing extensive research on the audience that is going to purchase that phone to make sure it's something that they actually want. And yet in health, we rarely design with the thoughts of the end user in mind. Think about that. Why would we not design health with the end user in mind? It's part of this culture that has come back for centuries. Even the Hippocratic Oath, dating back many, many years, at first do no harm. Well, for people with complex chronic conditions, it's not really a choice of not doing a harm. It's a choice of figuring out which benefits and which harms and which mix of the two make the most sense for you and your family. It's not about doing no harm. The progression of your disease will do harm. The treatments you take will have different side effects, different implications clinically, but also socially, emotionally, and within your family paradigm. 
we have to start thinking about health in a very, very different way. And we need to take ourselves out of this mold that we are going to be treated. We need to co-design the entire health ecosystem. The National Health Council has been at this for decades. In the early 80s, we led the movement for clear health communication and health literacy and shared decision making. And if you can't see this, it says, medical studies indicate most people suffer a 68% hearing loss when naked. And you have a poor gentleman sitting in that horrible hospital outfit. How many of us have had to endure that? How many of us have gotten really bad news and had a hard time processing that information? Years ago, my father called me and he wanted me to go with him to his doctor's office. And the reason was he was getting the results of some work. And he anticipated that he would find out he had cancer. So I went with him and I sat next to him. And when he got the news, he asked how long he had. And the doctor told him, you have two years. And I'll never forget my father looking him straight in the eye and saying, damn, five years is not a long time. We don't have the ability in our current system to understand the information that is being given to us, the ability to make shared, informed decisions that are right for us and our family. We've seen with clear health communication and shared decision-making tools that it can be done. But I can tell you, we learned a really important lesson in the 80s and early 90s. Creating the tools is not enough. You need to have a movement that drives a change in the incentives and removes the barriers. For 133 million people in the United States, people who are driving costs, did you know that just 20% of the population drives over 90% of all healthcare costs? That 5% of the population drives more than 50% of all healthcare costs? It's time to co-design a system for those of us with complex needs that is responsive to us as people. We learned in the 80s that despite those tools, we were still being treated as subjects. We were not getting the shared decision-making tools. We were not getting communication that we can understand. And again, if you can't see this, you have a group of doctors standing over a patient in a bed and it says, when we want your opinion, we'll give it to you. Now we've made headway, but it's time for this model to change. I'm proud to say that 15 years ago at the National Health Council, the patient organizations came together and we took the time to put together a strategy that was going to remove the barriers to meaningful access to healthcare and to really drive the incentives to do this right. And we focused in on five areas. The first one was on research. And we were front and center in the creation of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. It's an entity based in Washington. It's a quasi-government nonprofit entity. And it is designed to do research differently. All the research it does is co-designed with patients and all other stakeholders in the healthcare system. And it's designed to ask the questions that are important to patients. So that when you have a treatment, you have the ability to make an informed decision amongst the varying options as to which one is best for me, given my personal circumstances. It has had implications for NIH, how the Department of Defense does research, and implications globally, where we're starting to see research bring the voice of the patient into the forefront and answer the questions that are important to us, the questions that are relevant to us. And you can only know that if you engage people. Ask them, what are the issues most important? How do you prioritize those issues? The second area was in drug development. And Anne spoke about this. You led a patient-focused drug development meeting at the FDA to really help 
folks at the FDA and in the biopharmaceutical and device and diagnostic sector understand what are the issues important to people with arthritis? How do you prioritize them? How should life science companies think about developing new treatments? The National Health Council has accomplished five major pieces of legislation that have now made it not just a nice thing to do, but a necessity for the life sciences community. They are now engaging with patients at the front end to understand what are the areas that they should target in their therapies. They're working with us on designing the research questions, on looking at what patient reported outcomes would be relevant. What are or how would we design clinical trials so that we get the right information but make them as less, least burdensome for you and your family? How we deal with the determination of benefits and risk how we deal with post-market issues, even dosing and delivery mechanisms. And I want to give you one very poignant example. But we have had the opportunity to bring more than 26 different disease areas together to help demonstrate that what the outcomes that surrogates, often cases researchers, physicians, academics, even regulators thought were most important, were wrong. How many of you are familiar with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy? See a few hands. It's a horrific disease, 100% deadly, mostly affects young boys between three and four. By the time they reach their teenage age years, they've lost their motor skills. Eventually, they lose their ability to breathe. They're afraid that when they're sleeping, they're gonna choke and be unable to call out for help to their parents. When research was done amongst the family caregivers and the children with this disease to identify what was important to them, and it was presented at this meeting, people were surprised. All the biopharmaceutical companies and the regulators and researchers thought what was most important is let's figure out a treatment that will allow that kid to live six more months. And yet when you ask these kids and their families, they said, you know what? Six months on a ventilator, unable to speak, unable to move, being trapped in my body. I don't want that. That is not useful to me. Give me the ability to have enough strength to pick up my sleeve with my teeth, throw my hand on the table, walk across an iPad, and type out a message to my friend. Six more months of that, I'll take it. Six more months without functionality, no. You all know too well that what is important to you is often not what other people think. And it's up to us to make sure that people understand what are the right targets and how we prioritize those across populations, subpopulations, and bring it down to the individual level. We're looking at how we assess value and cost. This is a huge new issue in the US and something really quite striking because we are the last country in the developed and undeveloped world to not have a framework to assess value. Kind of surprising when you think about it. And we're seeing models pop up all over the country and they're determining what is value. The challenge was when they started, they had inputs from all stakeholders except patients. Now I ask you, how can we reach a common definition of value if patients are not involved? We have to be at the table and helping to determine what is value. We worked with our patient organizations and of the five frameworks assessing value in the United States currently, all of them made major modifications to include the voice of the patient. And the Arthritis Foundation worked really hard with one of the major framework developers to have a huge impact on their thinking about how to deal with treatments for people with arthritis. We've been highly involved in quality measure development, looking at how we remove some of these outdated quality measures and how we address quality measures that are truly getting at the outcomes that are important to people with chronic conditions huge mind shift in the quality space. But imagine if we had just two simple process quality measures. One, 
Did you sit down with somebody with a complex chronic condition and ask them what their goals are? Very simple, very simple. But how often does that happen in our current system? Even when you speak with physicians, and I want to be very clear, our providers are our closest allies. We do a tremendous amount of work with them. And some of them spend 70 hours with people with arthritis on a weekly basis. But they spend five to seven minutes with you. That's less than 0.01% of your life. It's an important interaction, but it doesn't capture everything that's important to you. We need to now look at how we design quality measures that do get at what's important to you. So a measure that says, what is important to this patient and family? And then a secondary measure that would say, how did you develop a care plan to help them achieve those goals? Two very simple shifts that over time could dramatically shape how care is delivered. We're also now very much involved in looking at how we design delivery systems, how we make them more responsive. We all know we live in a system that was based on acute care. It's an acute care model. Well, that represents a small population within our health ecosystem. We're now starting to think about how we evolve that, but the reality is we have acute care needs, we have population level needs, we have needs for people with chronic conditions and end of life. That requires very different thinking in how we set up our systems. And as I said earlier, a small percentage of people with chronic conditions are driving a majority, a super majority of the healthcare cost. We're starting to sit back and say, we need to redesign the system. And in redesign it, co-design it with people with chronic conditions so that we can most effectively meet their needs, help them achieve their goals, while at the same time eliminating waste and reduce cost. Huge new changes in how we think about health, all coming because of a collective patient movement. Now there's a friend of mine in Washington that says, you know your movement has made it when there's a glossary. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but we now have a glossary. We put this together, we now see the FDA, European agencies, industry, providers and other stakeholders using this to talk about patient information and how it relates. Patient provided information, patient reported information, patient generated health data, patient perspective information. You start to get the impression we have a lot of interrelated words, but we're now using them in the same way, understanding how they connect to each other. This is formed the beginnings of what is known now as the science of patient input. Think about that. Science of patient input is designed to help us innovate in new ways, not only in the treatments we will receive, but in how we deliver care. Huge changes coming on the forefront. Very exciting time. NIH said fairly recently, the time is right to be doing this. When you look at the rise of artificial intelligence, our ability to analyze millions of data points in seconds, personalized medicine, gene therapies, the ability to use large data sets and actually start to understand not only at a population level, but a subpopulation level and an individual level. How do we actually take the right treatment and bring it to the right person and deliver it in a cost-effective way that actually helps us to achieve our goals? Huge changes coming. I want to end with this. I think it's really important, and this, this depiction in the middle represents a patient. And I put it there because everybody in the healthcare system will say, I'm patient-centered. You know, it's sort of the new buzzword. It's become very, very common. Unfortunately, what a lot of people mean is, I put the patient at the center so that they will help me accomplish my goals. That's not patient-centricity, folks. We define patient centricity this way, and we use a very simple model. We call it the chronic care trifecta. How many of you 
know what a trifecta is? Hands? Oh, I love this audience. You guys are good. So you have a lot of people that play the horses, Anne. <laughs> a trifecta in horses means you, you call the top three horses in the right order. So I want to help you call the top three issues for people with chronic conditions in the right order. First one, pretty intuitive. We want the clinical outcome that serves us. Most of us would like to take a pill and be done. But at the end of the day, we want the clinical outcome that is right for us. But the best clinical outcome for an average person may not be the best outcome for me or for you. And that's our challenge. So it's more than just a clinical outcome. It has to be relevant to our life experiences. What is important? What is going on in our lives? What are we capable of doing? What are we willing to do? I have a relative in northern Maine. She has lupus. She's a single mom, didn't finish high school, working part-time, two kids, one with autism. Her mom has Alzheimer's and is living with her. She's eight hours away from the nearest major medical center. She has very limited education, literacy, and income. All of those factors have implications for what are the right and best treatments for her and her family. Third, and I think most important and often overlooked, what are your goals? I don't care who you are, we live for a reason. Some people live for their job. You might be living for your family. Some people may be living for their dog or cat. You have goals, you have things you want to accomplish. Those are critically important. And if the goals are not aligned with the care treatment, we're throwing a lot of money at you and not helping you. There's a woman in Baltimore getting first class care for a major medical center. She had two children, single mom, had diabetes and heart disease. She would go into the doctor's office and they'd say, you're gaining weight. You're not doing the right things. You're not taking your medication. You're going to have a stroke. You're going to end up going blind or an amputation. She hated seeing these people. Took a while, but a nurse finally asked her what was going on in her life. What were her goals? Turns out, she, her sole purpose for living was to make sure that her two daughters did not become single mothers without an education like she did. That was her sole purpose for living. And when she took the medication combination she was prescribed, it made her lightheaded and dizzy. You might say, that doesn't matter. It was the best treatment for somebody with diabetes and heart disease. Well, she drove a bus in Baltimore. She could not provide for her children and accomplish her most important goals of taking care of her family. Understanding that allows you to put together a treatment plan that actually works. This is not rocket science. And we're beginning to move the needle. We're starting to change the quality measures. We're starting to change how we finance this. The movement from value to population health is now focusing in on how do we get the right care to the right person. We have a long way to go to really transform the delivery system. But the seeds have been planted, the early adopters are there, the movement is headed in this direction. Now more than ever, we need to speak up. We need to demand that the health ecosystem includes the voice of the patient as an equal partner with all other stakeholders and that we become co-designers in how health works. Now we've made a tremendous amount of progress over the last 10, 15 years. We're now moving into that early majority phase. Over the next 10 years, this will become a reality for more and more people. And I know it sounds daunting, but I also know I'm in a room with a bunch of people with a lot of courage and a lot of willingness to make things happen. And I remind you what Margaret Mead said, never underestimate the power of a small group of committed people to change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that has ever done so. Purpose and passion. You have purpose. We all have passion. We need to accomplish change. I thank you for your time.
That was so interesting, Mark. Thank you for sharing all those perspectives and statistics for us and uh, sharing your personal story, uh, Jill as well and Anne as well, because I think that's what's really inspiring is that it is a personal mission for you and that is your passion. Uh, so together, you take your personal passion of your family connections that's driven you and kind of shifted you in the direction of what you're meant to do on this planet. And it is so cool that you guys have this fire. It is inspiring. It's contagious to all of us in the room. But joining together for that common purpose, and, and you said it in, and you reinforced it again, Mark, to be the voice of the patient. That's what it's all about, um, just that common purpose. And I learned so many things listening to you guys. Um, uh, I had to take a screen grab of this very, <laughs> it's gonna be seared in my memory, not only because of this patient's hairy legs here and point of vulnerability, I'm just gonna let that slide. But yeah, 68% hearing loss when naked, that, that really paints that picture of patient vulnerability and when you think of the power of the patients and the voice of the patients and then that vulnerability that just is so prevalent and you pointed out that other statistic of 133 million people in the United States with at least one chronic condition and that most of them are invisible. So to people like me, I've said before, um, who don't have that as a reality in our lives, it really is eye-opening to so many people to see how many of our neighbors, our friends, our families are dealing with these things that unless, like you said, Anne, you become that person at that point of contact that becomes that patient advocate, the patient angel, that family member, the extended family member in healthcare, it's going to be what makes a difference because it's not just the patient, it's not just the family, it is our collective community. So thank you for helping us learn more about how our volunteers are really helping shape the future of healthcare and ensuring that people with arthritis are fairly represented and it validates our work and our, motivates us to continue getting involved in raising our hands raising our voices to contribute to the cause. Mark's presentation is a great segue to talk about how we're changing the healthcare landscape with our major gifts campaign. Last year, we announced four innovative initiatives, and this year we're gonna start and share how our dollars are at work and what our goals are by playing four major gifts vignette videos. Tomorrow, our Senior Vice President of Revenue Strategy will give formal updates about this campaign and its success. So for now, uh, direct your eyes to the screens here, and we're going to share a video that's going to explain how we're putting the patient voice at the center of everything we do, as it should be, including bringing healthcare professionals and patients together for better health outcomes. Arthritis is a chronic disease that affects daily life in lots of ways. So why should conversations only happen when you're at the doctor's office? Wouldn't it be great if your doctor knew what you deal with every day? Not just the highs and lows since your last visit, but what you're really going through. A clear dialogue between the doctor and patient is crucial to being healthy. But so much of the care and treatment actually happens between visits and is often missing from those conversations. That's why we're implementing a promising new initiative to change how doctors and patients interact. Inspired by the successful SRQ system in Sweden, our proposed national network will provide doctors and patients with a secure communication channel where they can co-produce a care plan in real time. Patients will be able to record their symptoms, progress, and challenges. They'll be able to see it all in context and can compare current data with the past, as well as see what other patients are experiencing. They'll see if any changes mean it's time for a new doctor's appointment. This data exchange will promote an ongoing discussion between doctor and patient. Patients will have better control of inflammation and self-management outside of the doctor's office. And combined with information shared by thousands of other patients, this data will help inform research and outcomes for everyone. The initiative we're leading will revolutionize arthritis treatments through real, patient-centered care. But none of it can happen without your financial support a real change to the future of arthritis is coming. Will you be part of it?
In a few minutes, we're going to break for the learning labs. And during this time, you should attend two learning labs. Corporate partners, please join in the private summit. The first learning labs from 2 to 3, and the second is from 3.15 to 4.15. The locations of each session are in our conference app or in at your pocket agenda. And if you haven't downloaded the Live Yes app, please do so. It's just so easy. Uh, it's in the iTunes App Store or the Google Play Store to make it easy for you. Every person who downloads the app during the conference will get a pop socket for your phone. Does anyone have one of these already? Look at that. I actually had one already for my phone. And uh, my son is really into fidget spinners, fidget cubes. Do you guys have these in your home? I mean, you can sit there and just entertain yourself all day long. It also acts as a little tripod to take the perfect photograph and text easily. Look at that. So these pop sockets with the Arthritis Foundation logo are available once you download the app. Just another cool little incentive for you. And it also, um, Look at that, helps with joint discomfort. So there's an added bonus for you there too. If you haven't don't downloaded that Live Yes app, you can do so during the next break. Then visit the registration area and show the Arthritis Foundation the app on your phone and you'll redeem that pop socket. And finally, at 4.30 tonight, we're gonna hold our next plenary session featuring board chair Bing Chang, our special guest, and Bruce Marshall from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, SVP of Scientific Strategy, Guy Eakin, and Director of Patient Engagement, Suze Schrantz. Uh, the diverse group of experts here among us will divide how patients, they're gonna dive into this, how it's gonna help inform our work, the future research and drug development, and the active role the Arthritis Foundation is playing in patient engagement. So thank you so much for attending the 2017 Conference of Champions. Enjoy your time here in Arizona, and please, of course, may you leave here further inspired to make better tomorrows for our patients, our families, and our community. Thank you.